Welcome to the Be Bold Podcast. I'm Beth Whitman. Hola, como están? <laughs> After nearly a month here in South America, my Spanish is just starting to improve. I won't bore you with any more, but uh, I am picking up little bits and pieces here and there, and I'm, I'm proud of my progress. Now, listen to this. You know what that is? If you guessed that it's a video game, it would be a great guess, but you'd be totally wrong. Those birds are a near constant sound at the Napo Wildlife Center here in the Amazon rainforest of Ecuador. The birds are most active in the late afternoon and early morning, and that's when I'm recording this, but you can hear them pretty much all day long. Now, I'm just wrapping up five days in this area, and my time here was unlike anything I've ever experienced in my travels, as in it ranks as one of the top places I've ever been to. John and I are both here, and we spent our days out on tributaries of the Napo River, and that's actually that flows into the Amazon. And we were with both a naturalist as well as a local guide from the Quechua indigenous tribe. And between the two of these guys, we spotted dozens of bird species, including toucans, macaws, parrots, parakeets. We saw four different kinds of monkeys swinging through the treetops, and they were in groups of 20 to 100. It was crazy. We saw jaguar footprints, tarantulas. We saw an anaconda. And these guides of ours, they thought this anaconda was about 20 feet long. It was kind of crazy. We saw caiman. Those are like alligators. We saw fish. Uh, gosh, we just, we saw so much. Now you'll be able to check out my photos on Facebook. Uh, that's on my personal page. So you can feel free to friend me there if we're not already connected. And you can also follow me on Instagram and I'm wandergal on Instagram. Now I'm here doing research for future tours. So if any of this is remotely interesting to you, be sure to send me a note at beth at wandertours.com to be put on a list and I'll send you details uh, as soon as this trip is announced. So what's Wander Tours? Some of you may not know that I've been leading tours for more than 10 years to some pretty unique destinations like Papua New Guinea. Uh, and I've also got trips to more popular places throughout Southeast Asia, also to Bhutan, India, Ireland, Tanzania. I've led treks through the Himalayas and to Mount Kilimanjaro and more recently to Machu Picchu. And I've also got culinary tours to some of my favorite destinations in the U.S., including Santa Fe, New Orleans, and Seattle. Now, I don't offer all of these tours every year, but instead I like to mix it up a bit. So when you go to the Wander Tours site, you won't see all of them there, but you'll see what's currently available. Now, many of these trips are women only. Some are co-ed, especially if it's a destination where John wants to go, then I make it a co-ed trip. But whether it's a women only tour or a co-ed trip, these trips are transformative experiences. I really try to put together unique experiences that allow us to meet the local people and then incorporate just experiences and activities that can't be found on other tours. And all of that adds up to trips that are fairly stellar experiences for everyone. Now, you may know from my last episode a couple of weeks ago that I just wrapped up tours to Machu Picchu and the Galapagos. I was leading groups to both of these destinations. My groups departed last week, and I headed to the Amazon, which had long been a dream of mine. Now, in terms of those tours, I know that mm, maybe not the majority, but many of the people on those two tours, they pushed themselves just a bit to do things they never thought they could do. They hiked for four days on the Inca Trail. They reached an altitude of nearly 14,000 feet. Uh, they went snorkeling, some of them for the first time. They swam with penguins and manta rays and white-tipped reef sharks. Now, when you have experiences like that, you cannot return home and just be the same person. 
you've grown, you've morphed, you've stretched, you've become more independent, and you've just realized that more things are possible than you ever thought. You realize that the things you may have been telling yourself for many years, things like you would never be able to sleep in a tent or hike for 10 hours or breathe through a snorkel, that not only are these things doable, but then you ask yourself, what's next? What else am I capable of? This. This is the reason I travel and why I think it's so important for others to do so as well, because I know how much it will change your life because of the sites, the activities, and the other like-minded people on the tour whom you'll get to travel and bond with. And that is why I want you to join me on a future wander tour. I now have only a few spots available on our women-only South India tour that starts in late February, and just a couple of spots available on our co-ed trip to Papua New Guinea next August. And that trip centers around the Mount Hagen Sing Sing, which I know you've heard me talk about uh, before on the podcast. Now, I can't tell you the number of emails that I get from people who've hesitated to join a tour and then it's too late because it's sold out. So don't be a hesitator because you won't be able to join these trips last minute. You have to take action and join one of these trips. And then you'll see what I mean about these being life-changing experiences. Now, all you have to do is go to Wander Tours, and that's W-A-N-D-E-R, wandertours.com, and that'll give you a complete list of the tours that are available. Or you can send me a note at beth at wandertours.com and just let me know which destinations you're interested in. Even if it's something I haven't mentioned, if, if it's another destination, you know, maybe I'm planning on it down the road. Just let me know and I will contact you once we have something available. Okay, travel. Today's guest has traveled a lot, but not by any conventional method, at least conventional in my own personal experience. My conversation is with Kauai resident Vicki Punter. Vicki is a sailor, adventurer, and entrepreneur. Now, she grew up in the Midwest. She left for the Caribbean after some brief work on the mainland and then took off on a boat to find adventure after the then president of El Salvador mentioned wanting to sail around the world. Now, that planted an idea, and she figures that she and her husband, Captain Jim, have spent about 20 years on the water. Vicky is really unassuming, and I think much of that is because she grew up and spent the bulk of her travels in pre-internet times. But she really has lived a life of true adventure. She wasn't blogging about it. She wasn't posting on Facebook or Instagram about it. She was just doing it. She was living it. So in this conversation, we talk about those years on the boat, her meeting local indigenous groups throughout the South Pacific and gathering up incredibly unique art, which is now on display and for sale at her shop, Hawaiiki, on the north shore of Kauai. The thing that strikes me about Vicky is her willingness to embrace uncertainty, to be flexible, and to say yes to every adventure. You know, I've traveled a lot over the past 30 years, and I've observed and traveled with a lot of people during that time. And one thing I know is that there's a big difference between what a person experiences when they are flexible and they say yes compared to someone who questions everything and is fearful of what's ahead. It makes all the difference in the kind of trip and life you're going to have. Vicki is someone who is all in, and I love that about her, and I know you will too. Now, before we get into that conversation, I want to just note that we got interrupted about halfway through because of the landscaper working outside her house. So you'll hear us take a brief pause. You might also hear the rain in the background as well, which is pretty dramatic. Also, we recorded this in September when Hurricane Florence hit the East Coast, so you'll hear us reference that. Okay, with that, please enjoy this conversation with Vicki Punter. Are you a heat person? Do you mind the heat? Um, no, I've suffered through so much heat <laughs> that um, I have my ways of dealing with it. Oh, yeah. So how long have you been here on the island on Kauai? We arrived here in 2007, 
And we've lived here off and on since then. Mm -hmm. And the off part of that has been because you've been off sailing somewhere. Is that right? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Where was the last place that you traveled to? Um, the last place we lived on the boat was, I believe, in Fiji. Yes, where are my notes. We've lived so many different places. It's a, you know it's a good life when you have to look at notes to figure out <laughs> where the last place was that, uh, that you visited. Yeah. I often have that. I have to think, okay, what year is this? You know, what were the countries? And it's, in a way, it's kind of sad. And, it, and I don't mean to gloss over it at all in terms of being forgetful or just glossing yeah. over or forgetting about a specific destination where I've been. But sometimes I do have to really give thought, what countries did I visit last year? What places did I go to? How? Because I often get asked, how much of the time, how much of the year are you actually out of the country? And I have to give it some thought and kind of calculate. I should be ready with that, with that answer. I but know. I'm not. I, ex I know exactly how you feel. I've tried to come up with a simple way of telling people how much time I've lived on a boat. Mm -hmm. And my husband and I have had boats since we met 40 some years ago. And uh, at times we would only spend m a few months during the summer on the boat. And then other times we actually had no home other than our boats. And then after we opened the gallery, we l tried living ashore for a time and tried to buy some property and build a house and that didn't work out. So we got another boat. <laughs> so it's just been ongoing. And I figured out that I've spent approximately almost 20 years living on a boat of various sorts. And have you loved it? Of course, you haven't loved every minute of it. <laughs> no. But it, would you say I wouldn't have had it any other way? Yes, I would not have had it any other way. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. yeah. To be honest, I had trepidations all along the way. However, what happened with me was my, I couldn't say no. I could not say, I don't want to go there. Or I could not say, don't let this happen to us. I, it's not in my character. I've always said yes, when an adventure or a new experience has presented itself to me. Is that because you have a level of, we're just going to dive right into things right now. Okay. <laughs> is this because you have a level of guilt, as most women do, of saying no? Or is it because you are the adventurer and you thought, I'll be damned, I'm going to go do this? <laughs> <All right. laughs> a little bit of both. I mean, uh, there are times when I have needed to say, Whatever you think would be good for us, Jim, my captain, uh, because <laughs> Your captain and husband, <laughs> yes, because I didn't want to stifle his need for his own adventures. Luckily, I've enjoyed all of them. They've been wonderful, and also it's a it's a yeah, it's a guilt about not. I would never say no just because I don't want to want to deprive myself of an adventure. And if somebody says, let's go to the circus or something, I'm saying, okay, let's go. <laughs> um, that sounds great. My, my husband has a similar theory or similar feeling about that because I'll check in with him every once in a while. We've been together 18, a little over 18 years. And it was something very similar where he didn't travel much. He'd been to a couple of countries before he met me. And then, and, uh, you know, I just took him to a whole nother level. And, uh, and he's, I have to check in are you okay with doing these adventures? And he's like, are you crazy? Of course I am, you know, but he doesn't, he doesn't necessarily take the initiative right. to be the one because that's just not in his nature. And he calls me his, uh, what does he say? The, the charge ahead girl, uh, because I just, I say, okay, let's go do this. And he'll like, oh, okay, let's go do that. So, okay. uh, so it's, yeah, very similar, yes. just uh, different, little bit different roles there. But yeah, that sounds great. So you've had a life of adventure. So let's tell listeners just a little bit about how I came upon you first. And then what I want to do is I want to go back in time and I want to find out about those 40 years of travel and all that time, the 20 years living on a boat, which is just amazing. So I have been coming to your store and please uh, say the name of your store so I don't get it all wrong. Hawaiiki. Beautiful. Hawaiiki. Yes. Okay, great. So I've been coming to Kauai for a number of years, and I probably discovered your store, I'm going to say maybe six or seven years ago in Hanalei, just wandering around. I'd heard neat things about, you know, the little town of Hanalei and stumbled upon your store. And of course, because of my travels to Papua New Guinea, it captured me. 
It has the most amazing collection of artwork, really kind of carvings and jewelry and just amazing handicrafts that are there. Like that, I don't even know, none of those words I feel like do it justice because it really is like a museum and it's always changing too, which is really interesting. Every time I I come in there and it's usually once or twice a year when I'm on island and I say, okay, we have to drive up there to go see this great place. And it's changed a lot over the years. I mean, it's there's always something new and there's something developing that's going on there. It's really neat. But I just love the the shop. And uh, I started this podcast about not quite a year and a half ago. And so when I was just when I was in the in the store just a couple of days ago, I was looking at the photos of you and your family that rotate through on that on that screen in that one beautiful room. And listeners, you have to come to the store, you really have to come just to see what I'm talking about. So I saw that and I thought, Oh, my gosh, I hope she's on island. And you know, that this person who's working in the shop, you know, can can connect us and thank goodness she did. And I'm because I'm so excited to be here to, to talk to you. So that's the connection is that you own this beautiful Hawaii with your husband and Dylan. Mm-hmm. And tell me, you, you told me earlier what you called Dylan. Okay, Dylan, it, we call him our Hanai son. Hanai is a, a, a Hawaiian word and a tradition where a child or a younger per- person who's younger than you are starts living with you in a family way rather than with his own parents. And because we lived together on the boat for, I guess it was only four years, but it seemed, it it just continued on after that as well. Your friendship and your relationship. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, So as I said, you know, we lived, the three of us lived together on the boat as a family uh, for all those years and all those adventures. So when we thought we were finished cruising, We looked for a place to open a gallery because we had acquired too much stuff. (laughs) (laughs) And that brings in another thing, which was that we originally intended to go around the world. We didn't know much about going around the world, but we knew a lot about sailing because we had been living in the Virgin Islands and the Caribbean for decades. And what we discovered that we enjoyed the most was getting involved with the people in the countries by trading with them, particularly in the Solomon Islands, where we were overwhelmed by the diversity and skill of the carving, the carvers in an area called the Morova Lagoon. And we had learned enough as we went along that we could trade by giving them goods partially and giving them cash partially. And we just... What kind of goods? Well, fish hooks, clothes, batteries. Really basic necessities. Necessities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of necessities. Medicine. Well, those we wouldn't trade. We would give those freely. But that's what we learned how to do. And that's what we learned that we loved the most. You mentioned that you had been living in the Caribbean for decades. Yes. What? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Illinois and Ohio. And after I spent a few years working in New York City, I went on a vacation down to uh, St. Thomas. And I was fell in love with the islands. And I said, I got to live here. At that time, I was a computer programmer systems analyst. And there was one, com- no, two computers on the island of St. Thomas. Was this in the 70s? Yes. Yes, it was in the 70s. And I discovered these two computers. One belonged to the Department of Finance, and the other one belonged to a man who was running a little data processing bureau. And I visited him a couple of times and convinced him that he needed to hire me. So I left my fabulous job in New York City and moved down to the Virgin Islands. Did your family think you were crazy? No, they didn't. No. Why not? Well, certain members of my family thought I was crazy. Yeah, not your parents. No, no, they... They've always been uh, helpful to me. Do you, you have siblings? I have two brothers. Okay. Did they were they the ones who thought you were crazy? No, it was my sister. Oh, okay. <laughs> which I'm not. I'm not mentioning her. She said to me after one hurricane, she said, "Why do you even live down there?" <laughs> In the Caribbean. <laughs> yes, I mean, because we'd had a hurricane and I was begging her to help me. And But now everybody has hurricanes and yeah. it's much more common. And in those days, hurricanes weren't 
on the news every night. Well, yeah. we didn't have news every night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we didn't have it 24 hours a day at least. <laughs> right. Yeah. We may have had the hurricanes. We just didn't hear about them. Exactly. In, uh, exactly. In as much. Do you keep in touch with your sister now? No. Uh, my two brothers, I keep in touch with them. Right, they, right now they're in the middle of Hurricane Florence or, well, Tropical Storm Florence. Right. But so not, Are they in the Carolinas? Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. gosh. Yeah. I've just seen photos. I was at the gym this morning and um, just seeing on the news because I've been out of touch with the news, but just saw, saw the the photos on the news, the video is just really, really terrible. But you folks had a really big storm come through here earlier this year, right? It, it um, wiped at, out. Oh, we had a really bad rain event here in Kauai. It was a rain bomb. And it is caught, that is that really what it's called a rain? Uh, I, that was one of the things that the weather people talked about. It was not a, a tropical storm or a hurricane. It did a lot of damage to a very small portion of the island. And we were just on the fringe of that area that was badly damaged. However, I've seen in the Virgin Islands, we experienced two major category four or five, I don't know what they are, hurricanes. One in 1989, it was Hurricane Hugo, which eventually came up to the the shoreline of the east coast of the States. And that was a a devastating storm. And then... Where were you living then? In St. Thomas. And we lost our boat. It was, um, <laughs> it was, uh, just not, it was there and then it wasn't there anymore. It was up on the land and wrecked. And then 1995, there was another hurricane, Hurricane Maryland, and that was even worse. And we lost that boat. Why again. ever would you live in such a place? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, hey, it's kind of exciting. <laughs> it is exciting. And if you're a gal who likes adventure, then why not, right? <laughs> so, so you, um, so you found yourself in the Caribbean. You had your families, for the most part, you had your family's blessing, which I think that in itself is pretty amazing. That especially with parents, because for me growing up, I grew up in New Jersey. And I'm sure my parents are both past now, but I am sure that they had a number of technically not heart attacks, <laughs> but with all the crazy stuff that I've done over the years when they were alive, there were, there was a lot of cause for concern. They never told me not to do anything, but I'm yeah, sure uh-huh. in the background there was a lot of, you know, heart <laughs> thumping going on. So I don't know. Is that, would, would you say that's yes, probably I would, similar? Yes, I would say that's true. They once again never said anything about any adventure. They, kept their lips zipped and allowed me to do whatever I chose to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you took off, you moved to the Caribbean. Well, at first I moved to New York. Well, first I moved to San Francisco, then I moved to New York City. <laughs> but then I moved down to the Virgin Islands and lived down there for quite some time before we began the uh, around the world adventure. So you met Jim in, in the Caribbean. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And then how long did it take for him Maybe to quote unquote convince you that you should be taking off on some big uh, sailing adventure with him. Well, we started out. We had a restaurant in the no. First, we had a restaurant in Fort Lauderdale. Then we had a restaurant and a nightclub down in St. Thomas. Then we got uh, the boat that he owned. Then that was destroyed in Hurricane Hugo, and we got another boat and started doing charters. So we take people out for a week, feed them, take them around, show them everything, you know, pr- take care of them, make their beds for them, everything. And that boat we lost in Hurricane Maryland. So then we got another one, and it was our loveliest boat. It was called Phantom. It was a motor yacht. And um, one of our guests at some point, like in the late 90s, was the president of El Salvador. <laughs> <laughs> and his name is Paco Flores. And at that time, the country was somewhat stable. And he was, we understood that we believed he was doing a fine job to take care of a very troubled country. Uh, so he and Jim talked a lot in the evenings. And he said, oh, you know, I always wanted to go around the world in a sailboat. And Jim perked up. And he said, hmm, that sounds like an interesting (laughs) idea. So he planted the seed. Yes, he planted the seed. And uh, we had done fairly well with our business, our charter business. And uh, Jim said, hmm, let's try that. And I said, okay. (laughs) So it was, we were, so it's like 25 years we were together doing that kind of work till we got to this point where we decided we would go around the world. And what year was that? We decided in 2001. 
Yeah, because we just finished a Millennium Charter. And uh, suddenly we were shopping for another boat. Um, Something that could take you around the world. Is that yes, right? Yes, mm-hmm. because a motor yacht is, unless you have a huge budget and you have a, a lot of money and you have crew and whatever, can afford to buy the fuel and have a boat that's big enough to hold enough fuel to get you oh. over these longer distances. Yeah. You pretty much have to have a sailboat. Oh, okay, I never thought about that. I'm not a sailor myself, so I don't. Okay. I don't know a lot about it. So yeah. that's uh, that's helpful information. Yeah. Didn't realize that. So you look for a new boat. We look for a new boat and found Firebird, and we spent two years preparing for the voyage. So let me ask you something. So we're talking about the early 2000s. We're talking about very early, really kind of internet. I mean, internet for the masses. I know internet was was around before that, but it really, internet for the masses, that's around the time where I think we all became more familiar with it and had email and, you know, everybody was kind of still getting up to speed and getting out of dial up. During that time period and those very early travels, you probably didn't have access to information like you did just a couple of years ago, you know, because you've been sailing up until just very recently. Is that is that right? Yes. So you must have seen a lot of change between the early 2000s and just more recently and the amount of information that you could share and receive from other sailors. Is that right? Yes, that's true. The technology just had to it, have just soared. Yes. Uh, but I think that the changes have been happening just as quickly, even in the decades previous to our adventure. There are people who were out going around the world in the 60s and the 70s. And so with every decade, there was that much more information and GPS technology exactly. and all of that, that that had just led up to that. Yes. Okay, so, okay. So we, we had enough technology to do what we did fairly safely. We did not have simple ways to communicate with people. There's a, at that time, I'm not sure how people are doing it now out in the middle of the ocean, but we had to have a single sideband radio and a special modem, a packed door modem. And we would be able to write text emails on the computer. And then we'd be hooked up with the single sideband radio and we'd dial through to get a frequency from a, uh, an operator there are operators all over the world to offer their services to receive transmissions from boats. In emergency situations no. or just for communication? For communication. communication. It's very limited. You can't spend the whole day using their mm-hmm. uh, their antennas, but they receive the uh, communication that's been gone through this modem, and they then put it into their system and it goes into the internet. So I would write every few months, I would write what I call my cruising notes which I have here. (laughs) And basically, I had maybe two or three dozen people that had asked me to keep them informed about what we were doing. And uh, I would summarize where we were, where we'd been, where what our current plans were and things like that. So it's a basic blog. Yes. A very basic blog. Very basic blog. Mm-hmm. So I didn't know. It was, I just called it my cruising notes. Yeah, of course. <laughs> right. Right. Because blogs, they, I don't need. Yeah, I guess there were blogs around at that point. But just for listeners, that might be a great way to think of it, though. Yes. Mm-hmm. So what was your route for that first big round the world trip? Well, it, it took us four years to do all that we did. And we began when well, we were forced to leave the Virgin Islands because it was hurricane season again. And just a little anecdote, we had been preparing for several years, and we had had the commitment of a young man who was a South African. He had said that, yes, he would go with us on the, as our crew member on the voyage. And by the time the two years had passed, he had gone through some difficulties with his fiance, mm-hmm. and uh, he was no longer going to go with us, and we had no one. Uh, so... <laughs> Jim happened to be, um, we finally got an offer on the boat that we still had, Mm -hmm. the big motor yacht. And Jim had gone back up to Florida to take care of the sale. And he was in the uh, bookstore, the, what is it called? Blue Water Books. And they have everything for that any sailor needs on in books and charts and gimmicks and gadgets. And so uh, he heard somebody speaking uh, in a conversation with someone else with a South African accent. And we had had such great success with David, who was from South Africa, 
that uh, Jim just, you know, listened in for a little bit, and then he interrupted, or after the man was finished, he said, you know, I heard you talking, and I was just wondering, would you like to go around the world with us on your boat, on our boat? And he said, no, I've got my own boat. I'm not my own boat, but I'm a captain of a vessel already myself, and I have a friend. And so they arranged for Dylan and Jim to meet. They met on a Sunday morning, had tea at a Denny's restaurant, and made a deal. We said, Jim told them, you come with us and we'll pay you. And if you don't like it, we'll send you back. To and this is Dylan. This is Dylan. Where is Dylan from? He's from South Africa. Oh, he is. See, now I made an assumption that he was from here because you were using a Hawaiian word for son. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's what you did. You did say Hawaiian. You said yeah, it was said, a Hawaiian word, right? Han- Hanai. Right. Yes, the concept of, of the See, concept I, of relating. Uh, oh, okay. I assume that it, uh, that he was Hawaiian. So, oh, he's from South Africa. Where does he live now? Here in Princeville. Oh, how fun. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, neat. So uh, that is a huge leap of faith that you just brought somebody on board, <laughs> you know, that, uh, and I assume that at any point, if you weren't all getting along, that you could leave him at the next port. But there's somehow there is a there is a huge leap of faith that's taking place there that you're saying, come with us and, and he, be our crew. And he and same thing on his of part. Of course. Because he had only come uh, temporarily to Florida to participate, I believe, in some, uh, he's a lifeguard, and he had been in Fort Lauderdale for some kind of a competition of some sort. And basically, we just hijacked him. How, how old was he at the time? <laughs> 24, I think. Oh, yeah. What a lucky guy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, isn't that, he, family and, uh, you know, gets to sail around the world. That's, uh, that's really neat. Okay, so uh, you've got your crew, and then what? what's your route? You said that okay. over four years' time, which is just astounding to me. And one quick question yeah. before you tell me your route. Did you know it was going to be four years? No, we had no idea. It was very open-ended, and we did intend. The intention was to go around the world, not necessarily to... To uh, race. To, to, no, not to yeah. race, or, yeah. to, or necessarily to accomplish that, because... Uh, it just seemed like, you know, if once you get out there, might as well keep going. Would you have been intimidated or would you do it again if you knew that it was going to take you four years? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was um, It was about the journey. It wasn't about making some kind of a speed record or anything no, like that. It was just, no. it was really just about enjoying the journey. It was about journey. the journey. And I was awed, amazed, delighted, joyful about learning so much in that fashion. Because that was all firsthand, I didn't know much about, well, none of us know that much about the history of the world that doesn't involve Europe. At least when, when, of course, when I was young, it was all, all about Europe and European heritage and the, uh, that's where the world was, was Europe and then, then parts of the Amer- Americas and things like that. But there was all sorts of other things going on in the Pacific, which I had never learned. And so as we went along, we acquired more and more knowledge about the migration of the predecessors of the Polynesian people, how they migrated through the Pacific Ocean and eventually up to Hawaii. And that helped us tie everything together once we found our location here in Kauai because the, the many of the places we had visited were, are the, were the places where the predecessors or the ancestors of the Hawaiians had been living. So all just tied right together. And Through those South Pacific Islands. Yes. So we went uh, basically from uh, the Virgin Islands down through the Panama Canal, spent a little time in Ecuador, then across to Galapagos, then to the Marquesas, and the other French Polynesia Islands, the Cooks, a little place called Nui, then Tonga, and New Zealand. So by, I guess in a year and a half, we were already in New Zealand, and we spent what was they called their summer there, which was very cold. <laughs> uh, and that was like December, January, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. And so I was, because the hurricane season, the what they call, it's not hurricane season in the South, it's called cyclone season. And the cyclones can affect a lot of the areas that we had been visiting. So we were safe down in New Zealand. After that cyclone season passed, we left and went back to Tonga, then went on to Fiji, Vanuatu, the Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, and Indonesia. And then at one point, we reversed and 
did a f- came backwards for a ways. It mm-hmm. got ended up in Australia. Mm-hmm. And then when you say uh, so, when you went around the world, did you keep going and then make your way back around, or did you no. just? We only made it as far as Bali, and then you know we'd been at it for about three years or something like that, and we started thinking about the future. And the three of us would always talk about what we should do next, and none of us had any interest in going through the um, Indian Ocean or up through the Red Sea, because at that time there were beginning to be problems with pirates. Other, your option, other option is to go down around the tip of South, South Africa, and that's dangerous as well. Because uh, of pirates? That's because of weather. Okay. But, but pirates in the Red Sea, and then in the Mediterranean, we just kind of felt that we weren't going to feel comfortable in the Mediterranean. We probably really would have enjoyed the Greek islands. But, um, you know, I had been to the coast of France and did not really consider it to be the kind of place that I wanted to visit again. And we didn't really want to go back across the Atlantic Ocean, and we didn't want to end up back in Florida. So we had our little powwows, and we talked and talked and talked, and we just said, okay, let's just... We enjoyed Papua New Guinea so much, and we enjoyed the Solomon Islands so much. Let's go back through those areas, and in particular in the Solomon Islands, buy some more carvings, and then take the boat to Australia and end the voyage. So that's how far we got. And that's what happened? Yes. Okay. You didn't make a plan and then say, no, 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 now we have to keep going. No. (laughs) You actually ended the voyage there. Okay. Um, Just a note to listeners, we're in Princeville on the north shore of Kauai. It's just started this beautiful rain outside. And you might also hear in the background, the landscapers are out, <laughs> are out there, I think, cutting a lawn. I, I'm not sure with these microphones if that'll get picked up or not. But um, just to kind of set the landscape here, this beautiful rain just started coming down. And you do get actually quite a bit of rain up here, don't you? Yes, we do. Yeah, we're staying down in Poipu and we we stay down there because it's um, it's the drier, sunnier part. And if we're just going to be here for a week, that's what we want. <laughs> you know. Exactly. But it is gorgeous up here. It's so green and just absolutely lush and beautiful. So just setting the scene there. So you ended the voyage after four years. And then what brought you to the island here? We first stopped in French Polynesia and considered buying some property there. We didn't really know what we were going to do. Uh, We had been able to get on the internet and look to see what kind of businesses were available for sale. We did think that we would want to try to find a business to buy in Hawaii. We didn't care what it was. We just wanted a business. We wanted to get Dylan incorporated into the American culture. And How uh, long ago was that? This was in 2006. 2006. Mm-hmm. Okay. And um, the things we saw in French Polynesia weren't going to work out. And Jim, Captain Jim, had studied at the University of Hawaii when he was younger. And he always had talked about Hawaii, 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 Hawaii. And, uh, and we were listening to Izzy all the time on the music system and the boat. And so we decided to just look around Hawaii. And we came to Kauai first. And everything worked out. Everything happened to, hap- happened to work out for us here. Uh, we found the place, the location for the uh, gallery. We did look at some other businesses for sale that didn't seem quite exactly what we wanted. And so we thought, well, we'll go ahead with this idea that we had to just sell the stuff that we've already bought. How many pieces did you have or do you have, would you say, would, to start that business? Oh, my gosh. I think we probably started with a couple of hundred pieces. Where were they? Well, some of them were still on the boat, but others we had shipped back to California. And then when the boat was finally sold in Australia, all the things that were on board there were shipped here. Okay, because you had already set up a location here at least, or you had a place to ship them to. Yes. Okay. So not everything, but there are items in your store. There's one item that's $50,000. (laughs) Uh, $50,000. <laughs> <laughs> I took note of that. Okay. And I saw the beautiful, is it Cindy who works there? Uh, C- Sandy. Sandy, I'm sorry. Yes. So uh, Sandy who works there, we, we actually looked at the photograph. Um, we wanted to buy the photo of her. Oh, um, yes. We wanted it in the smaller version of it, which you didn't have in stock. So I'll have to ask you after this if you've got another okay. version of that. But we talked to her about that and she said, you know, that's me in that photo. And, and really it's the the beautiful shell lay was the feature of that 
gorgeous black and white photograph. And then she pointed it out in the shop and it's, it's a $50,000 <laughs> lay, which is amazing. But you have some carvings and some other very unique things in there that are really quite expensive. $8,500 for a, a carving, a large statue, I noticed. Now, again, um, for anybody who's stopping in there, just go because it's like a museum, but also not everything is that expensive. So there right. are more affordable pieces. And I'm wearing a necklace that from there too that I purchased a number of years ago, and it was not $8,500. <laughs> much more affordable. But what gave you the confidence to think that you, the gumption to think that you could open a store and have these unique pieces of artwork and that they would sell and sustain the business. Oh, wow. Because because really, you're not in New York that could sustain a very, in general, very high prices in terms of, let's say, artwork or very unique pieces yes. of work. Um, you're in a tiny little town and you're, I wouldn't say you're quite just off the main street, yeah, but you're are. not, you're not super obvious. I think you're behind the shave ice yeah. <laughs> place. <laughs> you're just a little bit off the beaten path there. What gave you the gumption to think that that, that that would work out? Because you're in business 11 years later. And when I went in there a couple of days ago, I've never seen so many people oh, in the I store know. and they were all picking up tiki, beautiful wooden, you know, just carved tikis and uh, just really beautiful beautiful statues and all sorts of things. And it was just the traffic was just amazing. So what, what I, made you think well, that was possible? I believe that it was more of Captain Jim's confidence. He had operated several businesses in St. Thomas in the years before I even met him. Uh, he had a place, a couple of um, tourist attractions, a tramway, a place called Mountaintop, where there were varieties of kiosks with interesting things for sale. So he had a little bit of a background in that already. We had no idea if it would work or not. We did sign a lease and got to work really hard. And it the business has grown tremendously since our first early years. Our, our first early years were very hard, <laughs> very hard. Well, you've expanded what your what your offerings are. And I imagine that that has helped. Well, yes. What we have done, what we did was to continue with the connection between the countries that we had visited and connect them to the Hawaiian culture. Uh, and that's been very joyful for us. It's been uh, quite a delight to learn more ourselves about the Hawaiian culture. And you may have seen in our garden, we take, took many years to create our garden exposition area mm -hmm. where we have posters showing the, the migration of the Polynesians and showing a lot of excellent paintings by some local artists about the uh, traditional Hawaiian life, things like that. So it could have failed, mm -hmm. and then we wouldn't be there. But people started finding, well, we worked hard to get more exposure. We always uh, have sponsored a lot of the uh, fun drives for the local radio, KKCR. Uh, we've had done a lot of advertising. And Dylan, of course, is a, a great spokesperson because he's got so much charisma. Anybody that comes in, they want to come back just to see him. <laughs> and he's probably got a delightful accent, yes. which always helps. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but we also found that uh, we, you know, people would come in and look around and, they, and we'd always try to put as much information on little tags as we could because we can't be there with every person who comes in so we can explain what each thing is. So people would come in, they'd look around, they'd, uh, they'd oh my gosh, it's like a museum, it's like a museum. And we heard that so many times. And so we thought, well, let's put up a sign that says museum. So we put up a sign that said museum. And one day I was looking out the front and I saw this woman with her child and she said, let's go in. It's a museum. Do you want to go in the museum? <laughs> no, I don't want to go in the museum. <laughs> so, so we took that sign down. Yeah. But we're always very happy for people. Well, we appreciate their purchasing things, but we're very, very uh, appreciative of people come in and learn something. And we always encourage people to stay as long as they want to. You don't have to buy anything. Just, you know, and let us know if they have any questions. And even children that come in, I try to engage them and tell them, you know, you let me know if you've got a question. If you see something you don't quite understand, you tell me. 
Well, let's talk about some of the things that um, that you have in there, and let's talk about uh, and also your travels. and And I want to start with Papua New Guinea because that's where I travel uh-huh. every year. And I know listeners of this, there are some who've been with me ah. to PNG too, so there'll be an interest there. I know that a number of your items are from the Sepik River area, yes. uh-huh. and then also you've got some items from West Papua, yes, as well. Um, had you have you traveled to West Papua yourself? No. We, okay. Well, we did stop in Manakwari, which is up at the top near the Bird's Head mm-hmm. portion. And most of our interest in that part of Indonesia, because that half of the island is Indonesian, is because we uh, spent a lot of time in Indonesia. And one of our sources has been um, here comes the lawnmower. <laughs> has been uh, going to Bali where there are numerous shops that gather interesting items from all different parts of Indonesia. Okay, for listeners, we had to take a little break there because the lawnmower guy <laughs> was just a little bit too loud. We couldn't, we could barely hear each other over each other when we took our headphones off. So we're going to dive back in here again. And we, we were talking about Papua New Guinea, we we're talking about West Papua and all the amazing things that you have in there. What I'd love to do is just, I'd love to hear some stories about your travels in that area, because I imagine that you're seeing things because you're you're just dropping in in a boat into regions where travelers normally don't go. So what? Let's let's hear something. Let's start with Papua New Guinea because yes, I, I because that's where my heart is and yeah. and uh, where I have spent the most time in that region. Well, I have uh, several good stories about that things that happened while we were in Papua New Guinea. For the first one, uh, we stopped at a little island in the Du Bois Lagoon called Panapom Pom, and we just thought that was the funnest name, Panapom Pom. But there were several villages on the island. And we had stopped in one that wasn't necessarily the largest or the most populous place. Anyway, we pulled in, we anchored, and there are a few uh, houses there. And uh, we started getting ourselves set up. And then I think Jim went in the water to snorkel and see what was going on. And uh, a young woman came out and told us that this area was currently under taboo in order to regenerate the creatures that would normally live there were not allowed to do any take any take anything from the water there and she was very polite about it and we became friends with her and her husband he was named uh joseph and her name was maria kind of like mary and joseph <laughs> mm-hmm. and they had a little boy that we called chicky boy because he was just so cute and we spent a lot of time with them we had spent time with them in, uh, around their village and they came out to the boat and we showed them everything and let them do whatever they wanted to do and just have a good time. Anyway, we were there off and on for, for quite some time. And we had been planning to leave. And uh, they knew we were planning to leave. And we'd already filled out, I've forgotten what they call them, but every little village has a book where cruisers, not every little village, but many villages have a book so that any visitor that comes can write a little bit of something. Like a guest book. Yeah, a guest book. So we had, somebody from the other side of the island had presented the, their guest book to us, and we'd filled that out. Now, Joseph and Maria felt slighted because we were really visiting them, so we recreated the whole thing for them. Anyway, we were getting ready to leave, and we suddenly, for some reason or other, decided we had to leave a day or two early. Well, uh, Joseph comes paddling out, and he comes aboard, and you could tell he was shaking like a leaf. And I don't know why we didn't understand why he was so nervous. And he said, finally, he said, um, <clears throat> we just wanted to know if you, if there's any way you could possibly help us out. And I said, what do you need, Joseph? He said, well, they've got a new tax now. Uh, you have to pay $3 per person each year to the government. It's like a head tax. And we don't have any money. So we, like $3. So he needed $9, yeah, yeah. the equivalent of $9 in Papua New Guinea money. And so, of course, we gave him what he needed. Probably we gave him some extra. And uh, and then the, just the next morning, just before we were leaving, they came out to the boat and gave us a little chicken that they had been their little chicken, but now it was supposed to be our dinner 
And they had to take, killed their little chicken to oh, give us. No. It was a scrawny little chicken. It was oh. like, it just was, you know, it's just the pure heart, everything through, through all of that kind of thing. Right. So that was a fun story. When so little means so much yeah. to them. Isn't that crazy? Just, well, that's what was so exciting about being there because we had stuff and we had the ability to buy things or to trade for things and to see that and that gave us a feeling of being, well, we were like celebrities because everywhere we went, people were surrounding us because we were somebody special to them. And it was so unique, yes. too, that you were there. Did you ever feel, because really, and, I, and I'm pretty open talking about this, PNG is not one of the safest places on the planet. Did you ever feel, and I know it's different on the islands than it is on the interior, kind of the mainland, if you will. Did you ever feel unsafe out on the islands and in the places that you were visiting? 99% of the time we were fine. I was just reviewing my notes and I think it was in New Britain. Uh, we were going along the southern coast of it, uh, which nobody ever visits. And we ran into some unruly village situations and people would just take help take things off of our boat, like our, our fishing rods that we keep prepared for cruising. And While fishing. you were on the boat? Yes. Or when you left yes, the boat? Yes. Okay. And uh, we had to do a lot of negotiating with the local village chiefs and stuff and trying to get other people to help us to get our things back. But that, that was, it was so rare and it wasn't... Did you ever feel threatened? No. No. It was just more, you have this, I want that, and yeah. I'm going yeah. to take it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, also, even in the Solomon Islands, for example, we well, I remember one island that we visited, um, we had left the dinghy at the beach and gone off to hear the children play panpipes for us. It was so beautiful and delightful. Well, some of the other children were delighted to discover our dinghy, and so they were having fun with it. They were playing in it, and they had, I think they had taken out some of the life jackets and so in essence, the, the life jackets went missing, but they weren't really, they didn't really steal them. They just, <laughs> they know, got misplaced. They, they didn't, they don't live in a, a world where this is mine and this is not yours. You know, they just, you know, everybody is kind of sharing what they have. Yeah. I had a guide on one of my trips to PNG when we were on a bus and he made a comment about, he was trying to understand cultural differences between the PNG people and between Americans, which most of my tour participants are American. And then there was another another group from an, from another country that he was dealing with. And I can't remember if it was Japanese or it was, it was someone else. And he was just saying, can, you know, can you help me understand this? When we have food, when we have something and we're on a bus, we share it with everyone. It's just a natural thing where everybody gets it. But uh, let's say your group or this other group, when they had something, they held on to it. Did they not want us to touch it? Was that the problem? And I thought, no, but I can see how they were, they, that they felt insulted because they were thinking, well, gosh, they just don't want us to touch maybe their bag of cookies. But it's because when we have food, you know, we have our small bag of peanuts and we eat our peanuts and we don't necessarily share them. But when they have something, it just gets shared. And I have discovered that if I have a bag of something and I hand it to the driver to share or I hand it to one of our guides, I have to fully expect that it's going to disappear and I'm never going <laughs> to yeah, see it again. So I, I either have to dole it out, give them, would yes, you like a couple, yeah, you yes. know, or, or just realize that it may disappear and I, I, and yes. I may never see it again. And it's yeah. just kind of an interesting, um, an interesting perspective because it's just everything is shared and it's not that it's community property. It's yes. all community property. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, especially in the many villages we visited, there's no outside influence. Like if something goes missing, you know, somebody else is in the village has got it. It's not like uh, it's, you can't get very far <laughs> no, you with can't it. Get very far. No, you can't. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Another one of our little stories was, let's see. This one is about Dylan. We ha found another little island that we loved. It was in the Hermit Islands, and it was... Uh, that's The Hermit Islands are also part of PNG. Yes. It's a, that's an area that I'm not familiar with, but it's on the East Coast, correct? Yeah, it's actually kind of northeast of Wewak. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, and we had been to a lot of the other islands and we went to this area called the Hermit Islands and stopped at this one called Luff Island. And we stayed there for quite some time. I think we might have even been there for Christmas. And the, the people there were just so incredibly charming and a lot of fun things happened, but they were, they were all competing and having, getting ready for Christmas and they were creating something special to eat or something like that. And then, so some of the ladies would handwrite these long letters saying, oh, oh, if you would so kindly, it would be possible, could I, would you have any cheese that I could use to make this one dish that I'm having? But don't worry if you don't have it or you can't spare it. But So, you know, it was just kind of like, a, it was kind of a, a very sharing thing. But the story about Dylan, Dylan made, well, we all made good friends with another family. It was a couple with uh, several small children. And the father had a canoe, a paddling canoe. And Dylan decided, well, what he did is he wanted to paddle. He wanted to sail from one island to the next one. And he knew he needed a sail. So he basically, he rented the boat from our friend. And together they built, all of us helped, we built a sail for the boat. But it was just a little canoe, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) a lot of foot, Mm -hmm. foot worth of high freeboard there. And um, the weather had been spectacular, and he planned to set off in the evening and paddle across the lagoon and out into the open channel and continue on to an island where we're planning to meet. And my Captain Jim and I were to follow, leaving it the following morning and going in the same direction and meet up with him at the island. And Dylan, Jim said to Dylan before he left, he said, be sure to tie down your coconuts because part of what he was taking with him were some drinking coconuts. Mm-hmm. And uh, so Dylan hadn't really spent the proper time experimenting with this vessel that he had created. And he got started out there and he discovered it didn't steer very well, but he persevered and he off, went off into the starry night and just, oh, it's just going to be a beautiful thing. And after a few hours, apparently the weather changed and he was having, I guess he had already gotten out of the lagoon and was in the channel. And he was having a lot of trouble, too much taking too much water on board. And he, a couple of times, he just about sank. And he lost his coconuts because he didn't tie his coconuts down. <laughs> and he managed to, you know, stay afloat and, and get, you know, the times that he capsized or whatever, he got back in the boat. And, you know, he was in dire straits. And he managed to figure out he's going to have to stop proceeding that way and try to get back to where he was on one of the little hermit islands. And he did. He just barely made it ashore. And it was in the middle of the night. And he woke up in the morning, bug bitten and thirsty and crazy. And he actually saw us pass by. (laughs) (laughs) We were on our way to go see him at the (laughs) other island. And he is waving, (laughs) yelling, screaming. And did you see him? No, we didn't see him. (laughs) Uh, when you're on a boat, uh, you can't you can't see a person. No, no. forty feet away, the, you could overlook them. So we went on to the other island uh, where we were supposed to meet him, and we kept asking everybody, "Have you seen Dylan? Have you seen Dylan? What? 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 What?" We spent two or three nights there, totally without any knowledge of oh, where Dylan of was. And finally, through the radio systems that they have. Uh, we learned that he... And by uh, radio systems, you probably mean they were knocking coconuts <laughs> no, together yeah, to... Not. Give <laughs> they, um, they had, I don't know if they used single sideband radios there or something like that, similar with a community. And they had just finally learned, for, for, they had been asking people that they knew, and they finally discovered that Dylan had was safe. Well, it, it was quite an adventure. He had tried to just get back to the little hermit island where we had made friends. And they kept... They took care of him for several days, and uh, then a dive boat came along and offered to transport him from where he was without his new little sailing canoe, Mm -hmm. because he had only rented that, Mm -hmm. and bring him to join us where we were on the next island. And by the time we picked him up, he, you know, he'd been treated as a guest on the dive boat, had been going on all these dives, and just that morning, they had gone on a dive, and the dive captain or director had this habit of taking an empty plastic bottle and taking it down with them and you squeeze it and it crackles and it draws the sharks. And he apparently has been doing this for some time. 
Well, this time a shark came up and bit him on the shoulder. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it was just a day, days full of adventure. He oh, was all gosh. right. He was okay. There was a doctor on board and yeah. she stitched him up or something. This like, wasn't Dylan that no, got, yeah, no, this was the, the other guy. The, oh gosh. Oh, um, and yeah, that was, uh, he actually has written that story out in detail oh, about he? his adventure. That, I feel like that's a that's Darwin at work when you're trying to a- attract the sharks and then it bites you. Yeah. Well, I don't know. You're kind of asking for it, it seems like. So so these destinations, would you have access to information to read about them or or would you or was it kind of the the sailing grapevine or forums that you were you were kind of sharing information and deciding where the next destination would be? There was a friend of ours that spent several days with us before we left, who had been traveling in that area, and who kept in touch with us by email. And he would tell us all these great places to go. He said, you've got to go to the San Blas Islands, or you got to go here, you got to f- look for so and so Peter Maipo in the such and such. And we actually did meet some of his friends. But a lot of it was uh, when you're sharing information, when you are in a place where there are other cruisers, you're just always talking, talking, talking. But it was mostly just exploring. We had enough information about weather and we had enough, we had chart plotters, which are like GPSs that everybody has today. But in those days, it was, it, there aren't any roads out there, but at least you can find out where the land is supposedly is mm-hmm. and where you supposedly are. And we used that to chart our way. And went wherever the next place looked like might be a good place to go. Do you find it really strange today that because I imagine when you're uh, when you're on a boat and you're on a boat for so long and you're not I mean you were basically I called it blogging earlier you had your records there that you were keeping your sailing records you know today everybody feels the need to document everything ah. with selfies and with blogs and with you know video blogs and they're on YouTube and they're posting everything you were just experiencing yes right is that fair to say yes that's very fair to say do you find that this world that we're living in right now is just completely strange. Oh, well, narcissistic. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of things that I find strange about living here in the United States now, uh, but I won't mention some of them. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we're 70 in our 70s now, and we're not in, surrounded by the culture that's doing all this blogging and selfie things. And, you know, although we see the tourists that come into our gallery, they're snapping photos and taking pictures of themselves outside. So we're not really exposed to it. We're kind of lost in some of our efforts to try to manage our iPads because we're we're out of it. Yeah, know? yeah. But yes. Um, I'm still yeah. trying to manage my iPad, by the way. So just, <laughs> like, just to put it into perspective. Uh, I don't know if it's good or not. Certainly people are able to then share their experiences further on. Now, we were very, very lucky that before we left on the voyage for uh, into the south pacific we they had just invented digital cameras and we spent you know we bought i've forgotten the name of the brand but we bought the best digital camera that was on the market and it was pretty expensive but we were able to take pictures the whole time and we couldn't do anything with them because we had no internet but i do have well you saw many of the pictures that Mm -hmm. we took so i think for example, you know, I put together this book of all of our cruising notes and where we were and how long we were there and talk about the people we met and everything because it's a very, it's a history. And to me, it's part of the reason I've done it and continue to work on it is because Dylan now has two children, Durbin and Missy. And they know that Dylan did some sailing and they're still young, so they wouldn't have the the atten- intention span to read the whole book. But at some point, this is the story of where their father mm-hmm. went. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm pretty happy about that. Yeah, that is nice. There's a movie, I don't know how recent it is. I actually saw it being advertised on the Delta flight on the way here. One of the movies that was available was about the young girl who sailed around the world. Do you know that? I don't know that movie, no, okay. but I know, I think I know about the girl. Yeah, yeah, there's, I think there's been a couple of them who've attempted it. One, I think, got into a very bad situation, if I'm, if I'm recollecting it properly. But there was another one, I think, who was successful. What do you think about, I don't know if she was 12 or like really, really young. What do you think about 
that. I think that without knowing the girl myself, uh, it's hard to imagine that a person that young could have enough experience. And yes, there are a lot of fail-safe things to outfit your boat with. Uh, you know, you've got an e if things all really go bad. Uh, so is that an, that's an emergency? Yeah, it's thing. an emergency. Uh, it's registered, and so you put out a it puts out a signal, a mm-hmm. uh, distress signal, and so somebody should be able to locate you. But there are oceans out there that are so huge, and there's nobody any anywhere near you. You, you know, even if people get the signal and know you're somewhere out there. It's still hard to identify. Uh, uh, help is not within reach. You cannot fly. I suppose you could try, but no, you can't do that. You can't f- fly to that location. You have to go by boat. Boats don't go very fast. They do not go very fast. We were happy if we were going maybe 10 miles an hour. <laughs> <I> was like, <laughs> oh, what a good day we made. We went 200 <laughs> made, miles. We <laughs> have made progress. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that that's astounding, and I'm not sure that, I would have agreed if she were my child. Yeah, yeah. You seem to have lived a a very, uh, fairly at least, I would say, bold life. Would you say that? Yes, yes. What 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 makes you? You're you're very quick to agree to that. You feel like things that you've done have been bold. Well, yes, because you have to understand that part of my uh, psyche has constantly compared myself to the other women in my age group. And yeah, in the beginning, I was a career woman. I you know, was living and working in New York City. But then I, I started adventuring. And uh, I never had children. Uh, I, you know, was not stayed, did not stay constantly in touch with uh, siblings or parents or, or nieces and nephews. And so the things that keep most people from being able to do great adventurous things are their family ties. And so I envy people who have big families. A woman my age could have grandchildren. I could even have had great, great grandchildren at this point, but I have none. And so, uh, there are two sides to the coin. Um, what I did was different and, um, I didn't get to do what a lot of other women do get to do. Mm-hmm. What do you think drove you to that? Do you do you have any recollection from when you were young that, uh, like, I make a joke that I grew up in New Jersey and people say, well, you know, why did you leave or why did you move to Seattle or why did you start traveling? And I say, have you ever been to New Jersey? <laughs> you know, love you, Jersey, uh, and family that's still there. But that's my joke that that's yeah. I want that I wanted to get out of New Jersey and away from the East Coast so much that it drove me, yeah. you know, around yeah. the world. But um, is there a moment for you or anything that? Not really. I think you know, as we were talking earlier about parents, when I was a senior in high school, I did my applications and I was accepted at Cornell, and I was also accepted at Vanderbilt, and I'm not sure what other places I was accepted at, but I wanted to be somewhere warm. So <laughs> I did not go to Cornell, because mm-hmm. I'd visited the mm-hmm. campuses, rainy and snowy and Lots cold. Lots of snow, yeah. And I ended up at Vanderbilt, and I had a chance to go on a program to study in France, and I asked my parents, and they gave it due consideration, because it was going to cost extra money. And they said, you may go. And so it was, I think, you know, my mom got married when she was uh, in her early 20s and she had five children and uh, she kept waiting for my dad to retire so they could travel. And then she died young. You know, she didn't get to do any of that traveling. How old was she when she she died? She was 68. So what I, I think somehow I absorbed from her this sense of, hey, you know, Vicki, being a mom, I'm glad I'm your mom, but you know, there are other things out in the world. Go for it if you'd like. You know, she never really encouraged me. No, you got to get married and have some children. When are you going to have children? You know? Right. Yeah. yeah. So oh, I, that's, that is great. D- and your sister, we know that she didn't have that same, <laughs> she didn't inherit that. But do your brothers have a sense of adventure? Um, they've come with us a, a lot on uh, some of our trips, on our sailing trips. Yeah. But, you know, an opportunity to do what I did uh, doesn't come up for most people. As you know, as you know, you've got people who would love to to do many of the things, and you know, you've interviewed Rita Golden Gold, Gelman, Gold, Golden mm-hmm. Gelman, mm-hmm. and she has made it work. But it is not an easy thing to do for most people. 
first of all, it's uncertain, and you have to be willing to embrace the uncertainty. Oh, I just treasure it. Do you feel like you're uh, channeling your mom, that you are literally doing the things that she couldn't do and that you're kind of following through? I don't know if I think about it that much, but I certainly recently have become more attached to my ancestors. Well, one of my tattoos that you were looking at earlier uh, was done by our friend Tihoti. And this time when he was visiting, he was very focused on ancestors. Well, he always has been. You know, I've never really thought about my ancestors. I knew a little bit, blah, blah, blah. blah, blah. But he made me, made me understand that it's important to revere and, and understand your ancestors so that you know who you are. And one of the symbols of a communication with you and your ancestors or the spirit world is turtles. Because turtles live in both worlds. They live in the water and they live on the land. So in the center of the tattoo, there's a little tiny turtle there. And so, um, I have been exploring my ancestors and I was hoping for some Indian blood, but I didn't get any. <laughs> I did my DNA. Uh, mostly European, primarily Scandinavian, but it's important for, I think people get very disconnected from the people that have lived their lives to the point where you are the issue of all of the efforts that they have made. My ancestors immigrated from, most of them from Scandinavia. I'm a descendant of Lord Baltimore. So he, that was before the United States was even formed and (coughs) certainly dangerous times, leaving safety of Europe and colonizing the Americas. My ancestors were outlaws. (laughs) 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 Which I think is so funny. Yeah, when you go back and you, uh, I've got, she's actually, uh, she's on Wikipedia. uh, Bell Star is her name. And I think there was a movie about her as well, but she was an outlaw in Oklahoma in (gasps) the 1800s or something. And so, yeah, so when you trace back my ancestry, I was like, I just think, yep, that makes perfect sense. (laughs) (laughs) So it's kind of funny. So as we wrap up here, um, a couple of just final questions. One, is there anything that, that we haven't covered that you'd like to share with listeners? I would encourage everyone, especially all of my lady friends and all of your lady friends, never say no. Just go for it. I mean, I met a woman last summer when we were staying in Ojai, and she was had lost her husband a long time before, and her son had finally started going to, to, to uh, university. And she asked me a lot of questions. And I told her, you know, I'd just been to Europe. I had been to Europe for about four months. And I said, Carolyn, when you go out there, you you know, you can't just go and like, think you're going to, you know, explore, you know, Italy and understand what you what you're doing. You've got to choose something that interests you. Is it fabrics? Is it color? Is it food? Is it language. You have to choose one thing to focus on because we went to Europe for for four months and we were all over the place. We were discovering things that were very, very interesting, but we didn't have a focus. Mm -hmm. So if we go again or any of you ladies want to go traveling, choose something that's part of your dream. Right. I, I specifically talk about that when going to India because it's so full on. There's Ooh. just so much there. Like, where do you even start? But if you can have one thing like textiles or jewelry, clothing, whatever it is that uh, that you can focus on, then that helps kind of narrow it down quite a bit. So, yeah. Not that my voyage in- involved any kind of focus. It was just like, <laughs> stay safe and keep dry. <laughs> you know, keep going. Yeah, I love that. Finally, uh, this is the Be Bold podcast. So tell me, I was in the podcast with this. What does it mean to you to be bold? It means to stand on your own two feet and take a deep breath and step forward. That is beautiful. Just a step forward. That is beautiful. Don't let your jitters <laughs> get you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. And read Tales of a Female Nomad. Yes. Read a Golden Gilman's yes. book. Go back and listen to the podcast that I had yes. with her too, which is uh, is pretty wonderful because she's a big inspiration. I read her book so many years ago and found it really inspirational. Do me a favor and hang out with me for just a couple minutes after I wrap this up. I want to have a bonus question that I'm going to ask you. I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I'm going to ask a bonus question. And for supporters of this podcast, they will get to hear that. So it'll be a little bit out of the mainstream conversation. 
And then um, as we wrap up, I just want to thank you again for having me in your beautiful home in Princeville because it is so lovely and lush and green and now the sun's out and that's what it does here. It rains and then it gets sunny and then it's going to rain in another 10 minutes too, but it's beautiful. And thank you for just for having me in your home and sharing sharing your store with everyone and sharing your story with me and with listeners. Well, you're more than welcome. I've had a grand time. Oh, <laughs> Love talking about our store and our adventures. I well, really do. Great. I'll have to come back and we'll, we'll expand on something, I'm sure, in the future. Thank you. Say yes to adventure. That's going to be my new mantra. She's really lived an enviable life, hasn't she? I mean, I know that she says she's given up some things to lead the life she has. But she really is in a minority when it comes to the kind of true adventures she's experienced. As for me, I am headed home from my adventures in just a few days and will be back into my normal, if there is such a thing, rhythm for a while. I've got a couple of trips tentatively planned to Austin and to the Bay Area. So if you know of any women in those two destinations that you think would be good podcast guests, let me know. There's a submission form on the BeBoldPodcast.com website, and you can just fill that out or email me at Beth at BeBoldPodcast.com. If you have a question about travel, about a previous episode, or about any other random stuff, let me know. You can call me at 877-280-5170 and just leave a message. I've been having a lot of fun answering your questions and would love to do more of those. So please give me a call. I, I may just feature you on a future episode. Don't forget to check out the show notes on BeBoldPodcast.com. And you can also find them on whatever platform you're using to listen to this podcast. You can find out more about me by visiting wanderlustandlipstick.com. Sign up for my newsletter on the Wanderlust and Lipstick site, and you'll receive a series of tips for making your travels safer. Last month, I ran a giveaway for a Prana Cozy Up jacket, and this month I'm giving away a Black Rapid camera strap. One winner will be chosen from subscribers to my newsletter, so make sure you're on board to get those details. For now, you can connect with me by friending me on Facebook, and I'm WanderGal on Instagram. I know you're now thinking of joining me for a future tour, so don't forget to check out wandertours.com, check out the South India tour uh, early next year, or the Papua New Guinea trip in August. Ladies, don't forget to join the Be Bold Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Be Bold group. You're going to love the positivity, the encouragement, the support that comes from that community. And while you're online, go to the Be Bold Podcast Facebook page and give that a like. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Be Bold Podcast. Until next time, be bold.